Good morning and a very warm welcome to worship. We are so glad that you've joined us and we are looking forward to a great time together. We will be staying online during August. There's been absolutely no change to government guidelines, which means uh, our experience of worship would be very restricted. There is one change. Um, we get to encourage all of you to wear face masks if we were together, and we know that wouldn't be a popular move. So we're going to be staying online for the five Sundays of August. In the meantime, we would encourage you to stay connected with one another, and perhaps phone someone, perhaps meet up, Maybe go for a socially distanced walk. All very, very good ideas there from uh, Louise. Anyway, this morning we've got um, three wonderful songs that have been prepared. We're going to spend some time uh, praying. And we have Lockdown Lowdown with Greg and Priya and Lou Cook and Jeanette. And we have Blast from the Past with Brian and Maria Rice and Eka. Alana and Beth are going to tell us one of uh, the stories of Jesus, a, a, a parable. And we have the Task King featuring young people bouncing things into receptacles. We will be interviewing some of our volunteers from the Food Hub. And we're going to begin a new teaching series for August where we look at some of the parables of Jesus. But first I'd like to bring you a few verses from Psalm 18. I love you Lord, you are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my saviour. My God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. The Lord lives, praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. Amen. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer.
Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would draw close to us this morning as we come to worship you. Would you comfort those who grieve? Would you heal those who are ill? Would you give strength and health to those who are caring? And would you give your peace and assurance, provision and protection to all of us who feel anxious about the future? We ask that you would give us your joy, your peace, your hope and your love through the power of your Holy Spirit as we worship you just now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're making food parcels, just putting together some essentials for people uh, when they're having a hard time. And it's just, yeah, just nice to help people. We're packing food parcels, and these are the items that will go into every bag. We've got juice and milk, or some cereal, and some rice and pasta, and some tins um, with some basic vegetables inside as well. <laughs> I volunteered because I wanted to feel that I was making a difference and helping those that are in desperate need at the moment. Um, I enjoy doing it because it's a chance to meet with others from the church and we have a natter and a laugh and it's just quite an enjoyable thing to do. I volunteered to help um, packing food parcels because when the Covid situation first hit then we heard so many stories of people being really worried about their jobs and uh, covering basic costs so I thought it was a simple way to help and I enjoy doing it because it's good fun it's lovely to be in the church be building again and meeting up with others and just doing something productive. I volunteered um, because I had to <laughs> but I have enjoyed it and it's great to put something back into the community. who buys and sells things. He is called a merchant. He has a fine fur coat and a felt hat with a floppy feather. It's his favourite. The house he lives in is huge. It has five floors and a fish pond with a fountain in the front garden. The merchant has everything he wants. He has 15 rooms filled with furniture. He has four freezers full of food and three fridges for fizzy drinks. And there is more money under his mattress than you could ever imagine. Much more. Yes, the merchant has everything he wants until... One day in a shop window he sees something. Something special. It is a wonderful white pearl. Five hundred thousand pounds, says the man in the shop. It's even more money than the merchant has under his mattress but he wants the pearl more than anything in the world. He hurries home. He has a plan. He sells his furniture, his fridges, and his freezers full of food. He sells his house, his fountain, and his fish pond. 
He sells his fine fur coat, but the felt hat with the floppy feather he keeps. It's his favourite. He borrows a barrow and bundles in the money. Off to the shop he trundles to buy the pearl. Oh dear, he's still six pounds short. Sell me your hat for six pounds, says the man in the shop. The merchant laughs. <laughs> he hands the man his hat and takes the pearl. Hooray! The pearl is his at last. Jesus says, God is like the merchant's pearl. It costs everything to know him, but he is worth more than anything in the world. Matthew chapter 21 verses 28 to 31. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count as loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Bid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. The very things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. When did such love and sorrow meet? Thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Last from the past. Hi, Hair Jen. Morning, Hair Jen. How are you doing? Or oh, evening. <laughs> so, Maria, when were you part of Hair Jen Salvation Army The Gap? Hi, we arrived in Hair Jen in um, 1995. We had just got married. We have just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary this year. Very exciting. Um, and we were there six years to 2001. Okay, Brian, why did you come to Hedge End and uh, what's the story behind the gap? Uh, we came to Hedge End, uh, both of us have been running churches, Maria at Poole, myself on the Isle of Wight, for several years. And uh, in training college, there was a phrase that stuck with me in an Old Testament lesson, which was uh, from Ezekiel, I looked for a man to build up the wall and stand in the gap so that I wouldn't have to destroy the land. And that phrase, standing in the gap, stayed with me from 1992 and, uh, and it wouldn't go away. And we both felt we wanted to plant a new church. And uh, we were kind of influenced by Willow Creek and John Stott, who's talked about having one foot in the word and one foot in the world. And all that came together beautifully when we felt called to plant. And uh, we came to Hedge End um, because the Salvation Army was going to shut it down and it was like the last ditch attempt. And it was a brilliant place just to start from scratch. So Maria, uh, what has happened since we left the Gap? Loads has happened since we've left the Gap. Um, we found ourselves uh, called out of officership as strongly as we felt we were called into it and uh, we found ourselves um, placed in God's hands and where he was going to take us next was to uh, land in Derbyshire. Brian continued 
um, using comedy in evangelism and um, being used by lots of different um, organisations and churches uh, travelling the UK. Uh, we were blessed, we are blessed, with two very beautiful girls, Naomi and Beth. Um, so when we landed in Derbyshire, we felt that we needed to stay here um, because that's the roots, that was the roots that they were putting down um, and this is where God had placed us as a family and God used us. Um, so that's where we find ourselves. Brian went into teaching and I went back to nursery nursing. Okay, Brian, so uh, where are you now and what are you doing? As Maria said, uh, I went into teaching. Um, so where I'm now, I'm at a secondary school, about 1,400 students, teaching uh, RE and philosophy up to A-level. And uh, we are in a local church and we are working with them, doing their alpha courses and helping them with that outreach too as well. Um, and uh, Maria, as she mentioned, is at a local primary school uh, doing nursery nursing there with lots of daily little ones. Uh, I get the big um, teenage ones, which I just love. And uh, Maria gets the daily little ones, which she loves. Uh, so we are still very much involved in uh, the local community and ministry. So then, Brian, how did your life at The Gap influence your life now? Uh, it, well, it, it changed absolutely everything from that initial calling and, and that scripture from Ezekiel. Um, we never looked at things the same again. Uh, our constant mindset was absolutely shifted to um, thinking about how unchurched people feel when they set foot into a church building or if they don't set foot into a church building, how we could communicate the word and the world and bring those two things together. Um, so we, we remain constantly aware of that in all that we do. Our ministry work is in our school and in our workplace and in our church. And we are always thinking about how unchurched people feel and think and how we uh, can connect all those things together. Okay, Maria, so six years, what do you remember most about your time at The Gap and anything that you particularly miss? Well, um, firstly, I think cause I've probably forgotten from the, the start, our girls now are grown up. Uh, Naomi is at Sheffield University and um, Beth is at Leicester University, although they both joined us for lockdown. So it's all fun and games in our house at the minute. Um, but yes, getting back to the things that we um, remember from Hedge End, I think the heady days of planning and uh, prepping and uh, again just being very aware of the culture that we were in and how unchurched people feel about coming to church and uh, they were exciting days doing that. I think one thing that clearly stands out, we started with a Friday night drop-in and whoa that was a good experience, that was a roller coaster of a ride. Um, ride. Um, and what is great to know now is some of those youth that started in that drop-in I know are, are, have become Christians and are attending uh, the, the church now or other churches in the locality which is just fantastic. Um, I remember the, uh, what's the word, it was very fluid on a Sunday morning um, that people would arrive, we would start at I think it was half ten and uh, at quarter past 11 people were still joining us which was just fab that people felt free and and okay with that and we were fine with that it was just great to see everybody um, but the biggest thing I think was seeing God change people's lives and it, and it wasn't just a one-off thing it was a regular thing uh, people would come each Sunday and share with us what God was doing in their lives um, and changing their lives in the week. That was great. So Maria, how would you describe your relationship with God today? I would say I'm still learning um, that God still takes me by surprise in the way that he leads us and uh, um, develops us as uh, Brian and Maria. Um, uh, I think um, I'm still growing that you know hasn't changed God keeps showing me new things and I, I grow into that um, but I think the biggest thing um, because in all of our uh, ministry um, and life together 
it has been a massive, massive trusting lesson um, because sometimes God has taken us places or we've found ourselves um, in places that we couldn't do anything else but trust. And I guess that's a big thing for me is that God keeps keep going deeper trusting really. How would you describe your relationship with God today, Brian? And what would you like to say to Hedgen Salvation Army today? Okay, first off, um, my relationship with God today, uh, like Maria, um, it's been like, like this. It's been quite a challenge. It's been a roller coaster. Um, it's deeper now than it was. Uh, you don't have the same faith you had when I was saved at the age of 18. Um, that has to change. The world around you changes, but your faith gets deeper. So it's, it's more grounded now, it's been challenged. I've had to really dig into it and, and see how legitimate my faith really is, whether it, it, it can be grounded. And for all the storms and the turmoil that we've faced uh, since we've left Hedgeend, uh, we found that God is there, the root and the rock of everything. So um, my faith is deeper and uh, more stable. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that I don't have hard days, we all do. In terms of my message to Hedgen Salvation Army, the fact that I can actually speak to you mm. and that you are still Hedgen Salvation Army is absolutely fantastic because in 1995, the Salvation Army were about to pull the plug and stop the funding and, uh, and it would not have happened. Um, you are, uh, it's lovely to be part of uh, the legacy of Hedgen Salvation Army to feel that we were a part of that foundation. So keep on going, please keep hold on to that original vision be people that stand in the gap on behalf of the land and stay faithful, stay strong, and we'll see you post lockdown. Hi everyone, this is Edgar, and I'm here to tell you about my experience with the Hedge End Corps. Gia, my husband, and I were appointed at DHQ in Southern Division, and our family has chosen the Hedge End Corps to come and worship. That was the best decision we made because we made lovely friends um, and it was the time when we all needed um, a safe place where we were accepted and loved and cared for and Hedgen was perfect. Uh, we still remember our time at Hedgen as the best time of our lives and it's true and I think it's because you guys have a gift of accepting everyone and embracing them with love and I do hope and you continue to do that. Uh, you have grown a lot since we've last been at Hedge End and that's a great sign. It, it, it's a sign that God is working in and through you and we wish you all the best. Thank you for what you've done and thank you for what you continue to do in our lives because we've still got connections with you. There are lots of you lovely people who contact us regularly and make sure that we're okay. So love you and wish you all the best. Tasking. I'm the Tasking and this is my assistant, Katie. Kate, what was this week's challenge? Make a trick shot using any ball into any container. The most difficult trick or the most surfaces bounced off before landing in the container wins. Trick shots can be judged as follows. More bounces are better. Big balls are better than small balls. Angled surfaces are better than flat. Roll-ins are nice. Projectile to receptacle ratio is important, as is the elusive X factor, which makes it a lot easier when we're defending our choices. There's a strange phenomenon which happens and only seems to happen to winners. First off, it happened to Alan, and then it happened to Ben, and now, sadly, Freya has succumbed. How do you suppose this was ever going to fly, Faraji?
first week of holidays had been very tough for Esther, so let's not give her too hard a time for this non-bouncing, diabolical nonsense. Next up, Ben. His video looked great until we slow-moed it and found out that Bex did half the work. So it's only fair she gets half his points. New entrants this week from Sandy the Snow Leopard and George Giraffe. Welcome and thank you for your videos. Here's William One Bounce Bungie, fresh from the barbers. Josh and Bex next with some more pantics. Solid attempt here from Dan with this multi-surface kitchen entry. Winning the mini league of flat pan bounces is Bethy, with no less than six. Count them. Lily angling for a good score. Third place this week is Beth with this 12 bounce stair spectacular. Second place with the largest projectile, longest distance, and smallest ball to target ratio. It's Evie. Finally, 
all the judging criteria flies out of the window if you do trick shots like this week's top trump. It's Alan! Congratulations, Alan. Okay, let's take a look at the leaderboard. Make a friend from an inanimate object. Make a video introducing us to your friend and give us their backstory. Well hey, so go to the cupboard, maybe grab a broom, put some eyes on it, a little bit of hair, introduce us to some Benny the Broom. today. Lou, what's been your lockdown low? I think for me, lockdown low has uh, not been able to worship with everybody, missing the worship team, missing being in church and all the hugs. Yeah. What about your lockdown high? Um, I think having family around me, uh, having Trev work from home, having all the kids at home, um, and just having constant company and so not feeling as isolated with having them there. And how has your faith helped you through lockdown? So for me, um, it's just about being able to have that time to spend with Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, time to journal all my feelings and just know that he's there, know that he knows everything that we're going through. It's nothing that he's not faced before. And that's really been what it's about, knowing that in everything he has a plan and he works all things together for good. What would you like to say to everyone at church? Oh, I miss you all. I can't wait to be worshipping live with you all again and all the hugs and just seeing people face to face. Thank you, Lou. We're very pleased to have Jeanette with us this morning. Jeanette, what's been your lockdown low? Um, my lockdown lows um, have been concerns really for people around me, mostly neighbours, I have to say. Um, that have been shut in their homes and have been afraid to come out. Um, found two families that I'm aware of in particular that were of a real concern um, and they didn't have much of a garden and I really felt, felt for people that were living in flats and 
you know, just couldn't get out in a garden for, um, you know, weeks on end, really. So really concern and, and uh, worry for others um, that, that just couldn't do anything. I think that was uh, one of my biggest lockdown lows. Um, I haven't had a great deal of lockdown lows, to be honest. I've managed to find quite a lot of positives. Um, but I suppose one other lockdown low has been obviously not being able to see family and friends. Um, although I have been the designated shopper for uh, a few of them anyway, so I have managed to see them from a distance. But of course you can't, you couldn't hug, you couldn't um, get very close to them really. So I think those are my lockdown lows. What about lockdown high? Lockdown highs, well, um, I've, I've found a lot of, lo of, of lockdown highs. Um, I've been very fortunate in the fact that God has blessed me with a few days work, work a week. So I haven't been furloughed and I haven't been made redundant. Um, and I really felt that um, God, that was a gift really, that I've been able to continue working. Um, I've loved the fact that I've had more time for myself. Um, I lead a, a very busy, hectic, uh, full-on life like lots of us do really. Um, and it really made me reflect and look at my life um, and the fact that I basically didn't have a lot of time for myself. So I've really enjoyed being able to do more exercise and meet up with Leslie and Catherine for walks now and again when we were allowed to. Um, I've enjoyed sitting in my garden and doing my gardening, which I've not had time to do before, um, and enjoying nature immensely. The silence and the peace and the quiet without traffic. And I've loved the fact that we've been able to contribute and lower our carbon footprint and start to repair our environment. And I, I've, I've been very grateful for that. How has your faith helped you to get through? Well, um, I've just felt God with me all the time, to be honest. I've had lots of answers to prayer. Um, I've really felt very, very strongly that God was sending us a message and he was showing us what we need to do with our lives and what we need to do to repair our world and showing us the way forward. Um, I've, I've just felt that so strongly and I've just felt that he's been with me and by my side in every situation that I found myself in. So, my rock. What would you like to say to everyone at church? I would like to say a big hello and uh, can't wait to see everybody. Stay strong and stay faithful and keep in touch with each other as much as you possibly can. Um, and let's catch up soon, I hope. Thank you, Jeanette. It's great to have Greg and Priya with us this morning, our divisional leaders. Your lockdown's been a little bit different. Would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, it was a bit different. So um, actually, before we moved to the UK a year ago, we'd always planned to go home for holidays uh, in March, late March, for a, a few things back in Australia. But of course, about four days before we were due to leave, uh, the Australian government uh, announced all Australians should return home. They said they were closing the borders to everyone but Australians, and that everyone would have to go into 14 days of quarantine. So all of a sudden, our long planned holiday had turned into something quite peculiar and a bit of a debate, should we go, should we stay? Uh, we did end up going um, and yes, we did go straight into 14 days of self quarantine. Um, and then the, op the um, continuation of that was, it was difficult to get back. Um, so what was meant to be a four week holiday at home turned into just over three months before we could manage to get a flight back. And then it was even complicated um, with masks and visors, the whole 24 hours on the planes and, and all of that. So, so quite a different lockdown for us uh, on holidays at first and then working from home, uh, but working from home a very long way away uh, in Australia. Um, so uh, we, we took the self-isolation, you know, for the social distancing very seriously, uh, 17,000 kilometres from, mm. from our workmates. So, uh, so quite strange for us for a while, yeah. What was your lockdown low? 
probably initially the lockdown low was that um, one of the reasons we were going to Australia was so that I could attend my graduation um, to receive my Masters of Theological Studies. And um, it was actually while we were in the plane um, that we actually received um, notice um, that um, that wasn't going to be possible um, and that um, it was all closed down and it would just be a virtual um, graduation and just watching it from our lounge room. So uh, that was the initial dis disappointment. Um, but in the scheme of things, um, realising that, you know, everyone was missing out on something and I think that would be the case. Um, so it was an initial disappointment of that. Um, and another low? So probably another low, again, a key reason to go home was to visit family um, and even though we had flights so our son lives in Melbourne which is where we went to as well as our parents our daughter lives in Alice Springs which is in the middle of Australia so even though we had flights booked to see Thea in Alice Springs um, in Australia the state governments are quite strong and again when we were on the plane from England to Australia the state government started closing their, their borders to each other uh, so we couldn't go to Alice Springs where our daughter lives uh, so for the whole three months we couldn't go there and to be honest if we were still in Australia today we would still not be able to fly from Melbourne to Alice Springs because the borders are still closed due to COVID restrictions so that was a big disappointment yeah. What about a lockdown high? Lockdown high would just be I suppose um, as we were leaving um, and we knew everything was starting to, to shut down I suppose one of the highs was that we just wanted to get back home and we wanted to get to Australia um, to see our family so that was a, a, a high just actually being there um, and also during a time when um, we were able to um, look after not look after um, spend time with Greg's mum and dad as well um, being elderly we were able to support them and help them with um, shopping and saying hello and, and things like that so that was a bit of a, a high um, yeah yeah and so similar things obviously just a chance to get back and it was all different. We couldn't really see all the family we wanted to and, and you know, we were limited, but it was good to see the few family members that we could. And in amidst uh, the middle of that as well, our son was actually decided to move flat from where he'd yeah. been living for the last year and a half since we left Australia. Uh, so we got to help him yeah, move house, good. pick a new pick a new flat, move, move house. So I think that was a bit of a, a high at the end of yeah. lockdown that we could help him with that. Yeah. How has your faith helped you through this? For me over this period of time, um, sense of faith has been uh, there in terms of helping me with constancy and stability, uh, I guess would be how I would describe it. Uh, no matter whether we're going through good experiences or bad experiences, for me my faith is something which, which is consistent for me and which helps me to have you know, a solid sense of where I am in terms of my own life and where I sit within the world. Um, you know, for me, it's good and important to remember um, that my faith connects me with the story of God, which began far before I was born and will continue uh, far after I'm gone from this world, but that I'm part of this ongoing sort of grand narrative of God's connection with this world and of God's desire for people in this world to know him and to love him. And, and so even when things might be a bit down and depressing, as they have been at times uh, over these past few months, I find that my faith gives me a consistency and a stability uh, in amongst all that. Yeah, and I think for me, um, it's been one of God's faithfulness. Um, I've been concentrating and thinking about the fact that over the generations, um, God has always been faithful um, to humanity and to his people. Um, and my faithfulness comes from God's faithfulness. And so even at times when I have felt, you know, um, a bit despondent, um, feeling a little bit down, um, I've just tended to throw myself back on God and say, God, I know that you've been faithful to your people um, and so that's helped me in my own faithfulness. He's sort of carried me. One of the images that um, has been really helpful to, to me over these last few months is the image of the rainbow. Um, if we think of the rainbow, the rainbow is something that God gave to humanity, um, saying to humanity that he, he loves us, that um, he believes in us, um, and it's a sign of hope. And so the rainbow has been very helpful. And, you know, as we've gone around, you know, and you've seen them too, around the, the streets in the windows, we've seen all these images of, of rainbows. And um, it's really been encouraging for, for me, that sign of hope that God has not forgotten us, that God is still with us um, and he will always be faithful and so that's been a real encouragement to, to me over these yeah last few months what would you like to say to everybody um, 
one thing I'd like to say is it's that even with us having been 17,000 kilometres away, uh, sitting in Melbourne, uh, it's good to still have been able to connect and to feel a part of things. Um, and so because of time zone differences, we couldn't join Hedge End Salvation Army on Sunday mornings because your Sunday morning was our Sunday evening. But there are a few Sunday evenings where we could tune in to Hedge End Online mm -hmm. um, and enjoy connecting with worship, uh, uh, seeing some of the different stories uh, that were being told there, enjoying uh, the ministry of the worship team and other aspects of worship. So even though we were so far away, it was good to know that we could still be a part of community here and that we could feel that we were a part of, of the community of the Salvation Army here, uh, back in our local area here, uh, so far from where we were at that time. I think on a more practical level, one of the things that I would just like to encourage people to do um, is to continue being safe uh, in this environment that we're all going through at the moment. Um, we are all in this together. Um, so I would just want to encourage people to do those things that we're being encouraged to do. Uh, wash your hands, wear, wear your mask, stay safe, uh, stay home if you, if you want to, if you need to. Um, because we are all in this together. So I know it's hard um, and it's inconvenient, um, but we are a community. And so we need to support one another. I need to stay healthy, but I need to do what I can. Um, and you need to do what you can do just to look after the whole community. So do what we need to do in order uh, to stay safe and stay well so that we've got a bright future. Graham Fear, thank you very much. No worries. Thanks for your time. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Saviour am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour. Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Saviour. Jesus had over 40 parables at his disposal. Using stories was a favourite teaching device of Jesus. He told them all the time to help people to think and understand more about life and it's likely that he used these stories more than once. So over the coming Sundays in August we're going to have the chance to look at five of these parables. Now many of Jesus' stories began with 
the kingdom of heaven is like. In other words, something of the reality of God's nature or character or rule is compared to something else. And today that kingdom comparison is made with a merchant. A merchant who comes across an item so exquisite that he simply has to possess it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a jeweller on the lookout for the finest pearls. When he found a pearl more beautiful and valuable than any jewel he had ever seen, the jeweller sold all he had and bought that pearl, his pearl of great price. Now, it is with great sadness that I read this week that the Argos catalogue is disappearing. Well, well, it's going online. And I guess that's a good thing because in the last 47, 48 years, almost a billion copies have been printed. That is a lot of trees. Now, for the Davis family, handing out four copies of the Argos catalogue to the kids before a journey through France has probably actually saved lives. And for that reason alone, I shed a tear. But I think further back to my youth, the annual Argos ritual commenced during October, studying and scrutinising the pages as the hunt for Christmas present ideas began. And you roughly knew the budget for different family members and you would kind of grade the items that you saw. Information needed to be submitted to parents by mid-November in case relatives started phoning and asking which presents the kids would like with suggested gifts allocated by a strict sort of relative generosity criteria. Now the emergence of the highlighter pen in the 80s greatly helped with this process as identifying and marking items uh, in such a way that they could be easily retrieved uh, became much easier. And, and incidentally, that highlighting procedure also applied very, very nicely to the Christmas radio times. Back to Argos. Once a paper round and a job at the Tesco Delicatessen had been secured with the influx of additional funds, Argos helped with the additional identification of items such as Sega Mega Drives or, or Betamax VCR type purchases. Argos helped a generation to source and cost such high ticket items. And here we have a tale about a merchant who is looking for high ticket items, pearls, pearls that would exceed um, even what you would find in an Argus catalogue or Ratner's. And, and this merchant identifies a particular pearl and he has to have it and he sells all he has to obtain it. Now the beauty of the parables is that they're not flat one-dimensional tales. You can't just pin them down and say, well, it means this or it means this, because many meanings can be drawn from most of the parables. They teach us on many levels. And the Jewish tradition was to sit around and reflect on a teaching and someone would propose a possible meaning and someone else might say, yes, but could it not also mean this? And of course, these observations wouldn't be mutually exclusive. Both things could be true at the same time. So we're going to explore one or two thoughts around this merchant and see if any of the ideas have resonance with us. Now, the most often heard explanation is this. In the story, we are the merchant. Jesus is the pearl of greatest price. Once we discover him, we must give everything we have that we might possess him. Now, there is merit in the idea that we would go to great lengths to be connected to the Christ, to be friends of Jesus. And anybody who's been following Jesus for longer than 20 minutes with any semblance of sincerity or integrity knows that there are sacrifices to be made. There are things that we would turn away from and reject for a greater gain and things that we would strive for that perhaps we would have once neglected as the kingdom of God reorders our lives. However, in the story as Jesus tells it, the merchant, our first consideration, us, buys the pearl, Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible's narrative is there the merest hint of a suggestion that salvation, the gift of Jesus, can be purchased or earned or deserved by anyone. Jesus came to offer himself to us as God's free, healing, restoring gift. So let's be clear, we can't buy him. We cannot earn our way into his presence, into his family. We can have it, but we can't buy it. But that said, this idea of sacrifice is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And maybe someone needs to hear and reflect on that notion this morning. 
that maybe there's something that actually needs to change because Jesus is infinitely more valuable than the values to which we're, we're living today. Something needs to be relinquished that we might possess him more fully. Maybe that's you. Moving on, I remember the first time I heard a slightly different interpretation. It was, it was mind-blowing. Jackie Pullinger, speaking at the Roots uh, Conference, Salvation Army Conference up in Southport, and she talked about reversing those roles, imagining Jesus is the merchant and we are the pearl. And Jesus seeks for precious pearls, and having found one particularly exquisite example, he gives all that he has to purchase it. Now, when Jesus tells this parable, he's speaking with the knowledge that he will give his life. He will lay it all down on an instrument of torture and murder, a Roman cross, to secure the object that he so desires, a restored relationship with humanity, which includes me and, and you. We are that precious to him. Philippians 2 verse 7 says that Jesus emptied himself. He had nothing left to give. And this makes perfect sense to us. The, the sacrificial death of Jesus is at the very heart of our faith and, and we are, or we, we should be, totally humbled by this truth. God so loves the world that he gives. And maybe someone needs to be reminded this morning of just how precious they are in the sight of God. Maybe someone needs a reminder that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's a story that includes us. We're, we're part of that. It was done for us. Is that you? Do you simply need to be reminded that Jesus did all of that because he loves you? Would this bring new life, fresh hope and deep meaning? Is, is it you? He loves you. Be encouraged. Know your true worth. Now, if you were a first century Jewish listener, this gets tricky. This understanding's not available. Jesus has not yet died. So how could people begin to comprehend a sacrifice that has not yet been made? So let's explore a third way and try and hear the text through first century Jewish ears. Now, a merchant to us is a generally positive uh, connotation. It's a socially respectable thing to be a merchant. It's better than being a door-to-door -door salesman or a, some kind of market peddler? I don't know. Merchants, merchandise. The, the Greek word for merchant is emporos, so like think emporium. Now in the Old Testament tradition it was an emporos, a, a merchant, who sold Joseph and other Israelites into slavery. Empori were, were regarded as, as Austin, uh, Austin, lavish, decadent um, people. Jewish literature suggests that the word of a, a merchant couldn't be trusted in Jesus' parable of the wedding banquet, one of the excuses offered is from an emporos because I, I, I've got to go back to my emporia. I can't accept your invitation. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. Like it's an iffy start from the Messiah. Merchants were not the toast of the town. Just as a side note, Jesus does this all the time. He dignifies the most unexpected kinds of people. Anyway, pressing on regardless, a merchant searching for valuable pearls. Pearls were for the mega rich, uh, hugely expensive items. Do you remember when Judas saw that some costly perfume had been poured onto the feet of Jesus? He was totally hacked off. This perfume could have been sold and the money given to the poor. Pearls were not everyday items. Pearls were produced within oysters. Oysters, shellfish. Uh oh, there's a Jewish non-kosher alert going off there. Another side note, Jesus sees his work as extending beyond the Jews to the Gentiles, the whole world. No one is excluded from the message of salvation. Anyway, this emporos, this merchant, finds an exquisite pearl. A pearl, singular. Wasn't he looking for fine pearls, plural initially, multiple items? And anyway, he's, he's, he's distracted by one particular beautiful example and he sells everything he possesses to own this one single item which would suggest to me that we have a merchant in a bit of a pickle he's got no home he's got no food he's unable to trade because all he's got is a pretty pearl which cannot clothe house or feed him he's given everything he's got so if you were there hearing this story as Jesus himself told it you might be left thinking we got a man in the wrong profession 
being wooed by the wrong target of acquisition, relinquishing his livelihood for an item with no practical value. We've got a penniless ex-merchant with a pretty pearl. And that's a crazy story. Whether you're a first century Galilean or a 21st century Westerner, this is not a sound financial life plan. It doesn't make sense. What is Jesus doing? I think Jesus always intends to disrupt and provoke people's attitudes rather than to reinforce and affirm certain customs. He always seems to want to get people to think differently. So here is a merchant who is completely countercultural. He's not following the conventions of the day. Is Jesus setting up an alternative uh, model or standard? Is he pressing people to think about what really matters to them? Is he asking what lengths they would go to in response to finding that one thing that mattered? Does that speak to us this morning? Have we found our pearl? that thing in the Argos catalogue of life that we have highlighted and reordered our life around the one thing which has grabbed our attention, the purpose to which all other things will bow, the thing for which we will make sacrifices? Or are we struggling uh, to work out the answer to that question? See, many things in our culture that purport to be pearls are fake. Are we backing the right horses? Are we backing any horses? Or are we just drifting through life? aimlessly without giving it much thought. Matthew 13 says that Jesus always used parables when speaking to the crowds. Why? Disruption, provocation, to get people to think about whether there were better ways of living, more helpful ways of spending our energy and ordering our lives. It's an interesting thought. What would it have meant to a first century Jew? This morning, some questions for us to dwell on. Firstly, is Christ the pearl for us to pursue? Are there things that we need to relinquish so that we can draw close or closer to him? Secondly, do we need to be reminded of how precious we are to God? Have we felt isolated, abandoned in these recent crazy months? Do we need reminding of Christ's willingness to empty himself of all but love for our sakes? Or is it that final question, what do I value most? Jesus cared about people's priorities. Is he asking me or you to reappraise and reprioritize so that our aims are kingdom aims? Or are we just wasting time and energy and stuff that nobody cares about, let alone Jesus? Is anything holding us back? Do we look like kingdom people? Or is it none of the above? Has something else stirred within you? that uh, requires attention this morning. That's the beauty of a parable. It can say many things and speak to different levels. But if it says nothing, I suggest we might need to pay more attention because something of the kingdom of heaven is contained in this story of the merchant and his pursuit of the pearl. Well, friends, during these unusual days of pandemic and impending Argos catalogue absence, may we hear the still small voice of Jesus telling us that we are beloved children and that he is worthy of any sacrifice uh, we could make or any reordering of life that we might undertake. May something about this curious story draw us and drive us towards our pearl of great price. Amen.
he has 